I want to talk this morning about the why questions. The why questions. We all have them, one time or another. Most of the time when we are asking the why questions, it's because we have experienced something that troubles us, something that's hard to take, hard to handle. We have an expectation, and the expectation was not realized. We had plans, and the plans were disappointed. Often, we will ask the why questions when there is a loss of a relationship. We ask why. We also tend to do this thing that we do to ourselves, what if? What if I had done this different? Or what if I had done that different? And we have anxiety and grief uh, with such surmisings. Other things that make us ask the why questions are a life-changing accident uh, that may occur, an upsetting diagnosis, a financial loss, the death of a loved one. Uh, Any great disappointment can bring us to that point where we ask, why? Why me? Why this? Why that? Why now? Well, if you have ever done that, Take heart, because you are in very good company. Some of the people that God has expressed His greatest praise for, some of the people that God has blessed and used greatly, also asked, why? Because they're human. Because God has not shared everything with us. The why questions are a per- perplexity to us. There have been times when God has answered the why questions. Uh, for example, uh, when Jesus was asked why a man was born blind, Jesus gave an answer. When he was asked by his disciples why he spoke to the multitudes with parables, he gave them an answer. But more often than not, when we ask the why questions, heaven is silent. Especially with those times when it is concerning his ultimate purpose and sovereignty in his doings. God does not reply. He does not answer these why questions. And this frustrates us because we want him to. We want him to tell us why. And we are sometimes frustrated when when he does not. The most pious and devout followers of God have been human enough to ask why. Now this question is is more a question of the heart than of the mind. Uh, Those who understand God and understand God's word can intellectually say, well, God is big He is very complex, his plan is very stretching and very inclusive, and that my mind and his mind are so far apart that intellectually I understand that there may be things that happen uh, that God does that I won't understand. So we intellectually accept it, but we emotionally struggle with it. That's a a thing in the heart. Uh, There are certain theological concepts that I believe and comprehend and and understand and accept theologically that in my heart I still wrestle with it. Am I uh, not by myself on that? Uh, I think that we all to some degree have that. Holy Scripture records some very spiritually deep people who ask the why questions. And our text this morning is a prime example, and in fact, I think the prime example, because we have two, we're going to look at one now and another later, but we have two who, who ask this very question. Psalm 22 and verse 1, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Now, this is David speaking, and uh, the word roaring kind of sticks out to me. I think of roaring, you know, like a lion roaring, but he's, he's describing himself roaring, and he's not roaring as a predatory animal. Uh, this is a groan. This is an emotional, grief-stricken utterance, and the groan is such a loud groan of emotional agony that it sounds like roaring, and he's saying, God, 
I feel like you've forsaken me. I feel like you've left me. Why have you left me? There are many other places in the Psalms where David asks a similar question. In Psalm 10 and verse 1, he says, Why standest thou afar off, O Lord? Why hidest thou thyself in times of trouble? Now, every one of us who are human beings live in the same world. It's the world of time. We live here. Uh, We live now. We live in this continuum. We live in time. And when David was saying, I'm in trouble, why haven't you helped me? David is making a reference to how he views time. Lord, by my watch, now David didn't have a watch, but if he did, I believe he'd be tapping it. And he would say, Lord, by my watch, it's time that you showed up. By my reckoning of time, uh, you're late. Uh, I, I wanted deliverance. It hasn't come yet. It should have already come. It has not. And I'm wondering why. Uh, but you see, the thing is what David realized in his heart of hearts and what we do as well is God's not on our timetable. He's got a different one than we do. Uh, Psalm 43, verse 2, he says, For you are the God of my strength. Why do you cast me off? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Psalm 44, 23 and 24. Awake, why sleepest thou, O Lord? Arise, cast us not off forever. Wherefore hidest thou thy face and forgettest our affliction and our oppression? Uh, So there are the why questions. There's also the wherefore questions and there's the how come questions. But they're all the same kind of question. Psalm uh, 74 verse 1, O God, why hast thou cast us off forever? Why doth thine anger smoke against the sheep of thy pasture? Psalm 88, 14, Lord, why castest thou off my soul? Why hidest thou thy face from me? Now, most of the time when David was writing in the Psalms, he, he's praising God. Most of the time, he's extolling the grace of God and the power of God and the love of God and and thanking God for his deliverance. Most of the Psalms are positive. Uh, But some of the Psalms are David wondering, where where are you, God? Where'd you go? I thought you were my friend. I thought I was one of your servants. I thought you were with me and I don't see you. I don't feel you. I don't, I don't, uh, where are you, Lord? Why have you cast me off? He had this emotional feeling that things aren't going like I hope. Things aren't going like I planned. And, and you know what? With all of these Psalms, we don't see any footnotes. We don't have any margin where God shows up and says, here's the answer, David. Heaven is silent. God doesn't answer these why questions. But about David... God said that he is a man after my own heart. Now there's another man that God had good words about in the Old Testament. His name was Job. In fact, God said about Job, among all those on the earth, there's not a more upright and righteous and just man. Now that's God's opinion. That's not some man's opinion. Well, listen to what Job said when he went through his great trouble. Why died I not from the womb? Why did I not give up the ghost when I came out of the belly? Now he's asking this in a moaning and crying out to God fashion. And he says, Lord, if this was going to be my life, why wasn't I just stillborn? If this was going to be my life, why didn't I die as soon as I was born? That is what Job is saying. I am so miserable. I am suffering so much. A life holds no joy for me. It would have been better for me that I died as an infant than to live to see this day. That's what he's saying. And why isn't it so? He's imagining, God, if this is how you're going to treat me, you should have just taken me when I was a baby. That's why. And listen, God let Job talk like that. God took it. God lets us ask the why questions. He's not going to answer them, but he's going to let us ask him because he knows we're human. He knows we're going to cry. He knows we're going to complain. He knows we're going to hurt. In another place, Job 7, verse 20, I have sinned. What shall I do unto thee, O thou preserver of men? Why hast thou set me as a mark? (laughs) Now, you know what he's saying? He's saying, Lord, why would you put a target up with my face on it and shoot arrows at it? That's how he felt. It's like the Lord is picking on him. Why have you taken time from running the universe to make my life miserable. Why have you set me as a mark against thee so that I'm a burden to myself? 
And why dost thou not pardon my transgression and take away mine iniquity? For now shall I sleep in the dust, and thou shalt seek me in the morning, but I shall not be. Now what he's saying is, you, you, if I've sinned, why don't you forgive me and, and let me come back? He doesn't understand what's going on. So if you've entertained questions like that, as I admit I have at times, we're in good company. In the human family, that is a reality that we sometimes will face. We tend to ask why when something happens that's hard to understand, something that conflicts with what we hope and what we expect, and it does not fit into our plans. Like Job and like David, we have limited information. We have limited perspective. We see what we see. We don't see what God sees. And with that limited perception, we draw conclusions that are incomplete and incorrect. Our emotions crowd out our intellect, and we find ourselves sometimes having a bone to pick with God. We find ourselves, though we may not articulate it in so many words, saying, God, is this the deal? I didn't sign up for this. I thought you loved me. I thought, uh, you, uh, I thought uh, you would be good to me. I thought you would bless me. I thought you would help me. But now look at me. I'm messed up. My life is messed up. And we say, why? David wondered. Job wondered that. Others in the Bible wondered the same thing. You know, we may not like it, and it may test our faith. But one thing that we learn from Scripture is that God does, does not answer these kind of why questions. He does not share. He does not divulge. We can speculate as to why. Maybe we wouldn't like the answer. Because just as our limited perspective causes us to not like what we see, our limited perspective would cause us not to understand the answer if one were given. Uh, you see, for us, to, we don't even know how to ask the right questions, much less how to perceive the answers. But he does affirm his love to us. He does affirm his love to us. He does say that his love for us is present and his, uh, his purpose for us is ultimately good. And so therefore we intellectually can receive what God has said. But here's the thing that we have to struggle with and we have to accomplish if we're going to be in a good relationship with God is we have to let that intellectual understanding come into our hearts and have an emotional acceptance and, and, and a submission to it. Let's go back to David. When David was carrying on like this and, and complaining and moaning and roaring, it was just a matter of time until God showed up and blessed him and gave him victory and gave him blessings and he was writing another psalm about how good God and great God is. Let's talk about Job. Job, if you've ever read the book of Job, it's a long book. A long book, chapter after chapter after chapter of beautiful Hebrew prose and poetry. Beautiful words, wonderful words. But these literary geniuses were all talking nonsense when it came to God's perspective. And he let them talk and talk and talk. And Job talked and talked and talked and talked and complained and talked some more. His friends took turns talking and talking and talking. And Job's talking and talking and talking. And basically saying things from his limited perspective. And then God shows up in a whirlwind. Maybe one of those desert dust, dust storms. And God begins to speak to Job. And he says to Job, stand up. Stand on your feet. I'm going to talk with you. <laughs> yeah. Job, you're about to get called on the carpet before God. You've said a lot of things. that He'd ask, why this? Why this? Why the other? Stand up, Job. We're going to have a conversation. So Job, sick as he was and full of boils as he was and frail, he stands up. You know the feeling? And God says, Job, where were you? When I created the universe. Tell me if you can. 
Where were you when I told the oceans where to be and the land where to be? Can you remember? Did I seek your counsel when I set up the world? He said, did I ask you how I should make the elephant? Did I ask you how I should make the crocodile? Did I counsel with you? Now Job's feeling this small by now. And basically God is reasoning with Job in language that he can understand. And God is saying, who's God here? Well, Job, the only answer is, not me. And the interesting thing about Job is when God showed up, Job didn't ask why anymore. He said, I have heard about you with the ear, but now I see you with the eye, and I repent in sackcloth and ashes. And here's what he said, I lay my hand on my mouth. Now what Job said is, I'm going to shut up now. I'm not going to talk now. You see, because in the presence of God, there is no need to ask why. The sovereignty and the power and the eternity overwhelms whatever it is that we may be thinking we're going through. And here's the thing. God greatly blessed Job so that the latter end of Job was twice as good as the first. Now, I don't know if Job ever got a full answer to what was going on. You see, we can read the book of Job. Job didn't have the book of Job. You know, if Job had the book of Job... He could have looked up and said, what's it say in my book here? Why is it that this is happening? Oh, I see. Satan accused me and God is testing me to see if I'll pass the test. He didn't have that. All he knew is he's minding his own business, being the most righteous man in the world. And all of a sudden he's lost all his wealth. So he sits down and he praises God anyway. And he said, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And then after that, he's broken out in boils from head to toe. He has a dread disease and he's miserable. People are laughing at him. People are making faces at him. His own friends, and these are good friends. These are good friends. You know, people talk about being Job's friends. Job had good friends. His three friends came to visit him when he was going through his trouble. And they sat down on the ground with him seven days and seven nights and didn't say a word. They were good friends until they started talking. If they had just kept sitting there with their mouths shut, empathizing and weeping with him, they would have continued to be good friends. But then they got the idea, okay, we got to help Job. we got to help him. Here's how we're going to help him. We're going to make him admit his big sin because nobody who's gone through what he's gone through can be righteous with God. It has to be some big sin he's committed. It has to be God is angry with him. It has to be judgment. It has to be. So Job, you better tell us what you did. Job says, well, I've been looking. I don't know what I did. Oh, I. So they started suggesting things, you know. You didn't help the poor. You didn't help the hungry. Uh, You didn't put clothes on those who were naked. You didn't do right. Job, you've been a little too friendly with the secretary. Anything they tried to say. Job was thinking, I hadn't done that. No, I hadn't done that. I hadn't done that. And he said, I don't know. I, I, I think I'm right with God. I think I've been living righteously. And they said, oh, there it is, pride. That's it. You're full of pride. And they kept going on like that chapter after chapter. And Job admitted, yeah, I'm a sinner, but I don't know what I've done to deserve this. And he didn't say it, but I I can't help but think he might have thought it. How come the Lord hadn't taken off with you guys? If I'm a sinner, so are you. How come I'm getting singled out? How come you're not full of boils? I mean, that thought would have come to me if it didn't come to Job. What happened? He asked the why questions. God showed up. And the why questions went totally out of his mind. He laid his hand on his mouth and he worshiped God. Jesus. Jesus asked the why question. It's a, one of the most theologically mysterious and rich things in the Bible. You see... Jesus came to earth, God in the flesh, to be God here. And every time when Jesus prayed to the Father, he called him Father. Every time. Check it out. Every time. Except when he was on the cross. 
And when he was on the cross, Jesus said this. We find it in two or three places, but in in Matthew 27, verse 46 is, is where I'm reading. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He quoted Psalm 22 and verse 1. So David said it, and Jesus said the same thing. Now, notice, all the times before when Jesus prayed, he prayed, Father. But now he prays, and he says, my God, my God. And the only explanation for it, and this works for me, is because at that particular point in the life of Jesus, he had taken upon himself your sins and mine. And he was speaking with our collective voice. He was speaking from humanity. Fallen humanity and the sins of all humanity had been poured into Jesus. That was the cup That was the cup that he revolted at, that he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood, that he said, Lord, if it be possible, let it pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. The cup is something that you drink. It comes into you. I believe at that time the sins of humanity, yours and mine, had come into Jesus, and he was us. He was guilty. He was vile. He was sinful. And from that state of extreme agony that surpassed any of the physical pain that he was going through. He cried out loudly, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because that's how he felt. Now intellectually Jesus knew his father. Intellectually Jesus knew the plan. But the emotion that he was feeling was our emotion and it was expressed. It's a rich thing, a perplexing thing. The, 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 the concept that God the second member of the Trinity of God could be made sin is beyond comprehension, but that's what happened. He took it, just as in the Old Testament when they would have the ceremony and the leader of the family would lay his hands on the lamb and they would slit its throat and he would feel the life go out of that lamb and he would identify with that lamb. And the Bible says this was an atonement. The sins of the family are placed upon this lamb. The lamb is now looked upon as the one guilty. The lamb is looked upon as now the one that suffers the penalty. And John said, Behold the lamb of God which takes away the sins of the world. Jesus took our sin. Jesus took our guilt. And he cries out with our voice with the why question. Why hast thou forsaken me? And then, as it was in previous times, heaven was silent. Instead, the sun refused to shine, and the earth trembled, and God manifested in such a way that something powerful was taking place here, something amazing. And he died. His chin dropped on his chest, his lungs ceased, his heart stopped. His blood no longer flowed. He was dead. Dead. Just to make sure, a soldier came up and thrust his spear into his chest cavity. And blood and water came out. Which we are told means that Jesus' heart had ruptured. Jesus died of a broken heart. Why? Why? Jesus was dead. They took him down. They wrapped him up. They took him to a sepulcher that a rich man had lent to him. A kind man. A generous man. A brave man. He said he shouldn't be buried like a pauper. He shouldn't be buried just anywhere. He should be buried decently. And he provided a decent burial place for our Savior to be laid. 
a very expensive burial place. And they placed him in there. And he was dead and motionless for three days. But then something happened. There was a stirring. <laughs> and there was a rumble. The guards had been placed there. The Roman seal, that wax seal had been placed on the rock. Rome and Judaism did everything they could to keep Jesus in that tomb. They had soldiers. They had authority. But when the angels showed up, you know what I think the angels did? I think they manifested themselves in such a powerful and mighty way that these guards just fainted dead away. You see, the angels can appear in different ways. Sometimes they just appear as men. I think these angels appeared like, you know, really powerful. And maybe they even made a scary face. I don't know. I would have loved to have had that job, though, wouldn't you, if I was an angel? Lord, let me be the one to go deal with those guards. Now look at them. They fainted. Angels appeared. The soldiers fainted away. And through the power of God, the rock just began to move. That Roman seal meant nothing to God. God doesn't recognize Rome. And Jesus came walking out. Alive. Alive. You see, that's the ultimate answer to the why questions. Redemption. Because we need it. Why am I sick? It goes back to the fall. Why do I struggle? It goes back to the fall. Why is my mind so limited and tormented at times? It goes back to the fall. Why is my body as I age a wreck? <laughs> the fall. Why do people do what they do to other people? The fall. Why do nations rise against nations? The fall. Why are so people so cruel sometimes? the fall. Why is it I can't seem to do right when I know what's right and I don't do it? The fall. You see, the answer to the why question is basically staring us in the face. We're all suffering from the same thing. It's called the fall. And it manifests itself in different ways, in different people, and at different times. You may be going through something right now and you're wondering, why are other people doing great and I'm not? Hold on. Time may pass and you're doing great and you may see some other people are not. Every dog has his day in the sun. It is said, God causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. Don't ever envy. Don't ever look at the lost and say, wow, looks like they've got it made and here I am serving God and look how rotten my life is. All the sacrifices I've made to, to make God happy and what's come of it. You better watch out. You better thank God. Listen, you know what Asaph in the Old Testament, he had that, that thing he was going through. He says, the more I serve God, it seems like the worse things are going. And look at all the wicked. They're getting rich. They're getting fat. They're so fat that their, their faces swole up and they can't even see out of their eyes. They're so fat. Their cheeks are bulging out. They've got all this wealth and all this plenty and they're ruling the world and anything they say, everybody repeats it. Oh, look at them. And here I am serving God. How, how bad I am. He was belly aching and complaining. And he said, I, I couldn't even talk like this among people because I'm supposed to be a spiritual leader. And if I said what I was really feeling, I would discourage others. So he had a lonely battle of wondering why things were so miserable for those that served God. And he said, until I went into the temple of my God. You see, he got the heavenly perspective. Then saw I their end. And to paraphrase... They are on a sliding board to hell. They're cruising. They're doing great. But it ends in hell. Don't ever envy the wicked in their strength or their success. Pity them. Pity them. You see, Asaph needed a perspective correction. And he got it when he went into the temple. And that's why we need the Word of God. That's why we need church. That's why we need prayer. That's why we need fellowship. Because when we lack the heavenly perspective, life is awful. What is the, the meaning of it? We're born. We go through some stuff. 
and we die. Listen, if there is no God, if there is no ultimate purpose, if there is no ultimate plan, I'm pretty bummed. If this is it, you have a few joys, you have a few laughs, you have some fun sometimes, but you go through some misery, and then when you die, you're dead like a dog, and your body goes to the ashes, and that's the end of you. Listen, you know why? You know why we ask the why questions? You know why we do it? The same reason a newborn baby cries for its mother's milk, because mother's milk exists. There would be no babies crying, wanting milk, if there were no milk. Do you know why we have eyes? The eye is an amazing thing, what it can do. You know why we have eyes? We have them because light exists. If there were no light, there would be no eyes. What purpose would they serve? You know why we have lungs? Because there is air. We have lungs to process the air. Air exists, so, so we have lungs. We have ears because there are sound waves. And our ears can pick them up. Everything that exists is connected to something else that exists. So why do we ask why? Why do we long for answers? Why do we crave purpose? Because answers do exist and purpose does exist. And we know it. We know it innately. We know it as a human family. And you can travel all around the world and study every culture you want to find from past all the way to the present and you will find the same thing in humanity. We suspect. We suspect there's something past this life. Now, people may not know how to articulate it. Their religion may be ambiguous about it. But there's something in the human psyche that demands an afterlife, that demands for perpetuation of who I am in relation with all that is. Where did I come from? Why am I here? Where am I going? That is what we all ask in every ideology, every religion seeks to answer those questions. And the only one that does it for me is what Jesus taught us. Where did we come from? God. Why am I here? God. Where am I going? To God. It is appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. We shall all stand before God to give an account. We sense with our souls when we ask the why questions that there is an answer. And there is. We may have to wait on it. We may not be able to comprehend it yet. But one day we will understand And I hear people say things like, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God this, or I'm going to ask God that, and I'm going to get my answers. Well, that may be the case. It may be. We'll have explanation time. I don't know. Haven't been to heaven yet. Haven't had anybody come back and tell me that's how it is. But I've got a suspicion. I've got a preacher friend of mine, pastors in Kansas City, went to school with him. He's a very deep, devout man, black pastor, great voice, great orator, love the guy. And he, in the eloquent way that he does, in preaching a sermon similar to to this theme, he said that when we stand before Jesus, and when we see his face, and when we see heaven's glory, with enlightened minds and enlightened, redeemed hearts. And when we see the scars in his hands and when we understand what he did for us, all we'll be able to say is, never mind. It won't matter now. We will know. We'll get it. We'll understand. That's then. Let's come back to reality. Until then, we're going to sometimes ask why. We're going to sometimes struggle, and God's going to let us ask. 
And He's not going to punish us. He's not going to be angry with us. He patiently waits for us to express our human frailty and our ignorance and our frailness. But then He blesses us anyway with faith. We long for an afterlife because an afterlife exists. We have that longing and that yearning because it's tied to something that's there. I believe it with all of my heart. Listen, this world, snap of the finger. We think it's long because we've been here a long time. Some of us longer than others, amen? But it's not going to be long before we see eternity, and that is what's long. There's a bigger question that we need to settle, and this helps a great deal with the why questions. And this is the who question. Who are we here for? Who do we serve? Who do we trust? And if we have placed our faith and trust in Jesus Christ and we have settled the who question, the why question goes down the list. Because I know this, Jesus has received me unto himself and I am in Christ Jesus and I am already sitting together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus and whatever happens here is just drama. Whatever happens here is just going on. I'm going to do my best. I'm going to try, but I'm going to fail and I'm going to miss the mark sometimes and I'm going to be able to be used of God to do some other things. I've got a purpose. I, I can make a contribution. I can do something that, that's a blessing to others and, and hopefully that will bring glory to God. But one day I'm going to stand before him and see and understand the why questions will all be a moot at that point. I am way more concerned with the who. The who. Who am I? Where am I headed? And why do I exist? And here's what the Bible says. It is the will of God. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It is God's expressed will in the Bible, in His Word, that you and I and everyone else repent of sin, come to Him for salvation and forgiveness and enlightenment and all the blessings of salvation. That's what God wants. I want what God wants. I want to say yes to God. Will you say yes to God? Will you surrender to Him? Faith is more than believing these things are true. Faith involves a surrender to the one who on the cross spoke with your voice and asked why. Dear Father, I pray that you would speak to hearts. I pray that you would bring to every listener a fresh and a new understanding of just who Jesus is and how wonderful he is and what he went through for our sakes. Lord, I pray that you would help us to trust you, to trust you when life gives us a hard time, when we have a setback, when we have a trauma that passes our way. Lord, that we may ask why, but Lord, at the same time, we say, Lord, I trust you. And Lord, that we praise your name. For it's in Jesus' name we ask. Amen.